Good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things at the top, and then I'll get right to your questions. So as many of you are aware, today is the 75th anniversary of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Secretary Austin released a statement earlier today on this notable milestone, which is available on the DOD website. Formed in the wake of World War II, NATO promotes security in the North Atlantic area, safeguards freedom and democracy, and provides collective defense for the alliance. Starting with an original group of 12 countries to the most recent accession of Sweden as the 32nd member, NATO is stronger and more united than ever. As we look forward to hosting NATO's historic 75th anniversary summit here in Washington this July, we will continue to strengthen our collective defense and deterrence through the development of advanced systems across all domains, combined training and common purpose to defend each other against all emerging threats today and in the future. To quote Secretary Austin's statement, quote, America's network of allies and partners built and sustained by successive generations of wise and bipartisan post-war American leadership remains a core strategic strength that no rival can match and that no foe should doubt. Today we salute NATO's achievements and we pledge to build upon them, end quote. Today also marks the official start of Defender 24, the largest U.S. Army exercise in Europe, as ships depart the United States carrying equipment for the event. Scheduled to occur through May 31st, Defender 24 will, will involve more than 40,000 service members from over 20 allied and partner nations, demonstrating the strong defensive relationships that are the foundation of European peace. The exercise, linked to NATO's steadfast Defender, consists of three sub-exercises, Sabre Strike, Immediate Response, and Swift Response. Defender 24 focuses on strategic deployment, interoperability and readiness while seeking to deter potential adversaries and strengthen the NATO alliance. For questions about the exercise, I'd refer you to U.S. European Command Public Affairs. Switching gears, Secretary Austin spoke by phone yesterday with Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant. The two leaders continued their regular dialogue on U.S. and Israeli efforts to ensure the defeat of Hamas and secure the release of all hostages. As was highlighted in our readout last night, Secretary Austin expressed his outrage at the Israeli strike Tuesday on a World Central Kitchen humanitarian aid convoy that killed seven aid workers, including an American citizen. Secretary Austin stressed the need to immediately take concrete steps to protect aid workers and Palestinian civilians in Gaza after repeated coordination failures with foreign aid groups. Secretary Austin also urged Minister Gallant to conduct a swift and transparent investigation into this incident, to share their conclusions publicly, and to hold those responsible to account. Additionally, Secretary Austin again raised the need for a rapid increase of aid coming through all crossings in the coming days, particularly to communities in northern Gaza that are at risk of famine. During the call, the Secretary also reiterated U.S. support for Israel's defense against a range of regional threats. A full readout is available on defense.gov. And to close out, sharing some good news, this week the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers reached a milestone in Maui where they cleared hazardous debris from the 500th residential property since the devastating wildfires. The Army Corps of Engineers is working hand-in-hand -hand with FEMA, EPA, the state of Hawaii, and others to ensure these sites are safe for the people of Hawaii. For more information, please contact U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Public Affairs. With that, I'll be glad to take your questions. We'll go to Associated Press first on the phone. Today we've got Lita. Hi, Pat. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of questions on uh, the call he had with Gallant. Can you say um, whether or not um, the secretary is involved in any ongoing U.S. assessment to determine if Israel has made any of these tangible changes that the White House talked about uh, a short time ago. Can you say whether the secretary was one of the people dialed in with the president's call? Uh, the White House mentioned uh, Secretary Blinken and, and others were, was Secretary Austin also listening in on that call? And finally, did the secretary mention at all to uh, Minister Gallant anything about the U.S. limiting or conditioning military sales on any of these improvements? Anything else, Lita? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think those are all the questions for the day. Um, all right, so just taking it, taking it from the top. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the concrete steps uh, that have been highlighted and that the White House highlighted, um, you know, Secretary Austin, of course, uh, maintains a uh, professional relationship with Minister Gallant. They communicate frequently, as you know, uh, and so I expect that to be a, a topic of discussion going forward. Um, in terms of today's call with the Prime Minister, uh, to my knowledge, the Secretary uh, was not uh, in on that call or listening in on that call. Uh, and then uh, as far as your, your last question, um, you know, what I've provided in the readout uh, is what was discussed. And again, the Secretary uh, reiterated U.S. support for helping Israel defend itself from a range of regional threats. So I just leave it there. Let me come back into the room here. Jennifer. Um, Pat, are you rethinking the employment of the so-called JLOTs, the seaborne delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza in the wake of the World Central Kitchen um, disaster? No. Uh, the JLOTs continues uh, to be uh, en route. Uh, we expect to achieve uh, oper full operations capability uh, by the end of the month, early May, as, as we talked about, approximately 60 days. Uh, although, of course, we are working to, to move as quickly as we can on that front. Uh, and so once operational, again, uh, the uh, capability that that will provide is uh, the ability to send upwards of 2 million meals per day uh, into Gaza. And so planning for that continues. Uh, we're on, on track uh, in terms of the timeline, uh, and we continue to work closely with partners in the region. Uh, as you've heard others say, Israel has committed to providing security on the shore for that effort. Um, when it comes to the uh, receiving and then onward distribution of that aid, uh, we're working with USAID and others uh, to finalize those details. I don't have anything to provide to you now. There's so many groups now saying they won't distribute in Gaza. They're pulling out. The UAE has just frozen relations. How do you plan to distribute aid and not have either chaos or a security situation? Yeah, again, I mean, this, the situation there, uh, and of course, this strike certainly doesn't make that job easier, uh, but that has not deterred us from continuing to work with groups. Uh, and NGOs to, to come up with solutions. That's what we've been tasked to do, and we'll continue to do that. And what's the Pentagon's assessment of Israel's plan to enter Rafah? Um, to my knowledge, we haven't seen a detailed plan at this point. Uh, as has been mentioned, um, we've been briefed on concepts. Uh, as you know, there was a, a meeting at the, the White House, a virtual meeting earlier this week, to continue having that conversation. Uh, and so, again, I'd refer you to Israel in terms of their plan, but we continue to highlight uh, the fact that any operation needs to incorporate civilian safety uh, and ensuring that, um, you know, humanitarian assistance can get in. But essentially no plan has been shared with you. There's no plan at this point. To my knowledge, we have not received a detailed plan. Um, after his call with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the president in the statement said, you know, the U.S. will change its policy if Israel doesn't make some changes in its sort of Gaza war effort. Given that you're a planning organization, have you at least started planning and looking at what aid you would con condition if those sort of benchmarks aren't met, set out by uh, President Biden? Yeah, thanks, you just at, at this point, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. And secondly, um, in the call yesterday, did the secretary get a better understanding of how um, the Israelis could unintentionally strike three vehicles over one and a half kilometer? Uh, you know, again, obviously, as, as we highlighted in the readout, uh, the strike did come up. Uh, the Israelis have initiated an investigation. Uh, I think they've spoken, uh, at least initially, on some of the preliminary findings. Um, but, of course, uh, we don't want to get ahead of that investigation, uh, so we need to wait and see what comes out of that. And last one, why does the Secretary feel that Minister Gallant will now listen to him? I think the last time they spoke, the Israelis then killed aid workers a week later. So why now? Why would you listen now? Look, again, uh, the secretary and the minister have had an ongoing dialogue. Uh, they, the secretary respects Minister Gallant. Uh, you know, they have um, obviously communicated very closely on the situation, and Secretary Austin has very clearly communicated our position on what needs to be done in terms of safeguarding civilians. And so I uh, expect those conversations to continue. Let me go to Orrin. Uh, Pat, 
we're now at roughly the six month point of the war. Can you say, looking back, having spoken repeatedly about the need to protect civilians, that you have seen Israel take some sort of concrete steps that has improved their protection of civilians and their strikes? Because from what we see, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly not enough has been done, uh, which is, again, what I've highlighted in the readout and was part of the conversation that the secretary had with Minister Gallant. Uh, that conversation is happening at multiple echelons within the U.S. government. I mean, to, to answer your question, uh, in certain areas, we have seen them uh, take action, but clearly not enough. Uh, and so, again, we're going to continue to uh, set that expectation, and we're going to continue to have those conversations. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Daniel Compatangio for Italian La Sette News Channel. Um, I have a que two questions. One is about Gaza and the other one about Ukraine. The first question is, what are the steps suggested from the Secretary um, to de-escalate the situation in Gaza, looking to the escalation between Israel and, and Iran, who is very dangerous at this time. So what are the steps suggested toward peace? And then the second question, it would be about uh, Ukraine and Russia, the situation in Ukraine. From the European perspective, although there are a lot of aids coming in, it seems stalling. And um, so again, what um, the Pentagon um, suggests to, to move the situation and, and find a solution toward peace, because uh, Europe is afraid of a war. Sure. Uh, well, when it comes to the situation in Gaza and, and you know, broader escalation throughout the Middle East, uh, the Department of Defense continues to remain focused on four primary areas. Number one is the protection of U.S. citizens and service members throughout the region. Number two is working with Israel and others in the region to uh, the, for the release of hostages that are being held by Hamas. Uh, and then the other two objectives are ensuring that Israel has the ability to defend itself from future terrorist attacks and broader regional threats. Uh, and then finally, preventing a broader regional escalation. And so uh, that has uh, included, you know, not just on the Department of Defense side, but across the U.S. government, uh, both diplomatic uh, efforts, but then also uh, by us for having forces in the region that are able to support regional deterrence, uh, as well as provide us options should we need to respond. Uh, again, at the end of the day, it, we, we recognize Israel is engaged uh, in a, in a in a very difficult conflict with Hamas in Gaza. Um, but, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, again, prevent this from spreading. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is not really listening, it looks like, to what the president is suggesting. Yeah, I can't speak for uh, the Prime Minister. And I'm sorry, your second yeah, question? If you briefly can say something about the situation in Ukraine, the stalling of the war, what is the Pentagon is suggesting to move it forward and maybe finding some sol sort of solution? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, our focus is on supporting Ukraine and its ability to defend itself and take back sovereign territory, and so that will continue to be our focus. Let me go to Missy. Hi, Pat. Uh, just uh, going back to the Gallant call, uh, did Secretary Austin convey the same message that Biden conveyed to um, Netanyahu that the U.S. policy on Gaza would depend <coughs> on these particular things? No. Um, okay. And... <coughs> You know, because the the um, assistance to Israel is mostly military, I want to ask you the question, sort of, that that John Kirby was asked today, which is that you know, if they're saying that suggesting that the U.S. could change its policy vis-a-vis -vis Gaza if Israel doesn't take these specified steps, it suggests that the U.S. could curtail or suspend military aid. Do you is that an accurate understanding of what that means? Well, again, like I. I know that uh, Mr. Kirby spoke to this. I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of the, the White House on this or, or preview it. So I think, um, you know, I'll let the president's words, the, the White House's words, stand on their own. Thanks. Body. Thank you, General. Um, I believe when the secretary was uh, at the Hill, he mentioned the number back then, 25,000 uh, civilian death in Gaza, and he said majority, majority of whom were women and children. And yesterday, in the call for the first time, uh, we read that he expressed outrage at the death of aid workers. Why wasn't the secretary outraged before yesterday? Look, the secretary has been clear all along uh, that this is a tragic situation. None of us want to see innocent civilians uh, killed in this conflict. 
that is a conversation that he has had with Minister Gallant from the very beginning of this conflict. So to to uh, make the accusation that somehow uh, one set of people killed uh, is is unacceptable versus the other, that's just an inaccurate characterization. I didn't make that accusation. You made no, that you, comparison. No, you, you, you made it. I would, I would have said it. You know, I'm very okay. frank, but thanks for making that comparison. Um, the second question, uh, we, we've been asking the same question over and over again, and we received the same answer that there are no conditions on U.S. aid to Israel. At the end of the day, this is an Israel operation. Suddenly today, we hear a different tone, that there's going to be conditions if Israel doesn't do this and this and this. Would such a warning coming before today, would it have saved innocent lives in Gaza, uh, including an American aid worker? Uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals, but thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Gerald. Uh, at the White House briefing, John Kirby said that in the past couple of months, the U.S. hasn't provided any emergency military aid to Israel. Is that because Israel hasn't requested any aid along those lines, or has the U.S. been turning down those requests? No, look, I mean, as, as you know, we've got a, a long-standing security relationship with Israel, uh, and, and as he also highlighted, uh, foreign military sales, foreign military financing, uh, many of those requests uh, are years in the making. Uh, and so it's a combination of the two. Uh, but as we've highlighted, shortly after October 7, very shortly, we were able to rush some additional security assistance to help meet Israel's immediate needs. And no additional assistance has been rushed in that way since the sort of <coughs> I mean, we continue to support Israel uh, with, with the capabilities that they've purchased as well as requested, but I don't have anything specific to read out to you. Let me go to Jeannie. Uh, thank you, General. Two questions. Uh, Experts said uh, North Korea's recent launch of a solid fuel resisting missile could pose a threat to the U.S. air station in Guam. What is your comment on this, or how did your assessment on this? Well, you know, look, um, we're aware, of course, of the, the testing. We're consulting closely uh, with our allies in the region. Um, but. I'll just leave it at that. At okay. the second yeah. one, and uh, President, uh, Russian President Putin and uh, <coughs> Chinese President Xi Jinping have a meeting, will meeting in next month. And uh, regarding what concern do you have about uh, military cooperation between China and Russia, as well as movement in military cooperation between North Korea, China, and Russia? Well, again, look, our focus in the region is on working with allies and partners to ensure regional security and stability, uh, and, and that will continue to remain our focus. Each of the nations that you highlighted are sovereign nations, and, and they're going to make decisions about who they cooperate with and, and who they don't. Where it becomes a problem uh, is when there we start to see malign activity in terms of uh, providing Russia, for example, with capabilities that they're then in turn uh, using to attack Ukraine. Uh, so again, we'll continue to monitor that that closely. All right, let me go to the phones here real quick. Let me go to uh, Patty, Task and Purpose. Hi, Pat. Um, so there was reporting from an Israel-based magazine, 972, about um, the IDF's lavender system, which found that they were systematically targeting um, individuals while they were in their homes at night, while their families were present rather than military activity. I, I understand that you won't, that you can't comment on IDF policy, but I'm wondering if you can just talk about, does the U.S. support using AI for targeting? Yeah, so I, I've seen those press reports, Patty. I don't have anything as you highlight. I, I'd refer you back to uh, the, the Israelis to talk about uh, any capabilities they may or may not have. Laura. Um, the JLOT's capabilities, when is that expected to arrive in Gaza? And do you have a committed partner yet that will distribute aid from this pair when it's built? Yeah, I think I, I think I answered that earlier. But uh, right now, again, um, we are expecting JLOT's to be online uh, by the end of the month, early May, uh, at, on schedule. Uh, again, we continue to work closely with USAID and other partners, uh, NGOs, to discuss the aid delivery and distribution. Uh, and so as we uh, have more information to provide on that front, we will. Are you, is, are you going to continue setting up the pier once they arrive if they don't, you don't have a committed partner in terms of security 
for the U.S. personnel setting up the pier and in terms of protecting Yeah, again, I, as I highlighted, Laura, and sorry, maybe, maybe I wasn't clear, uh, Israel has committed to providing security on shore, uh, so we're continuing to work with them on the details of that. Uh, and again, um, we're not changing the mission. Uh, we've been tasked to provide a temporary pier. Uh, everything is on track, on schedule at this point. Uh, and so again, as more details come in, we'll be sure to, to give you an update. So just, just to be clear, even if you don't have anybody that's going to distribute the aid, you're yeah, going to I'm not going to give hypotheticals. Okay. Well, I mean, Courtney. that's not a hypothetical, that's true. No, you're yeah. saying if you don't, we're, we're not there yet. The pier's not stood up yet, and they haven't arrived in theater yet, and we're continuing to work through those things. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep you updated. Courtney. Just one clarification on that. So there's, the, uh, the Israelis have agreed to do security on the shore. Does, are they doing security for the distribution, though, as well? Is that Again, we're working through all the details. Clearly, Israel will be an important partner when it comes to security for all the obvious reasons uh, in Gaza. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics um, you know, again, we're working through a lot of those details, but as this comes online, we'll have much more to say. Was that part of the conversation last night, those kinds of specifics, with, or yesterday afternoon, with the secretary and his Israeli counterpart? They, they did discuss uh, maritime uh, delivery of aid, yes. Including the IDF for providing security Correct. throughout the whole process? Well, providing security, yep. So, okay. Louis. Um, going back to one of the earlier answers, uh, I think to Jen's question about distribution, distributing the, uh, the aid coming through the maritime corridor, um, you said that this strike certainly does, doesn't make that job easier. Um, can you provide some context as to uh, what you're talking about there and how it makes it more difficult for the Pentagon? In that yeah, well, I mean, a couple of things, Louis. So, I mean, first of all, um, you know, the, uh, I was reading an article earlier today that highlighted the fact that uh, it's that, uh, you know, this is a, a dangerous place. It's a combat zone. And so, you know, uh, certainly the aid groups that are there are operating in that environment under extremely difficult circumstances. Uh, and so the fact that you are delivering aid within a combat zone, uh, the fact that you saw what we saw earlier this week in terms of the Israeli strike, despite the fact uh, that by all accounts, the, the World Central Kitchen had coordinated with the Israelis to be able to access that area. Those kinds of things need to be uh, fleshed out and ironed out to ensure that any aid distribution can safely do that. Uh, so I know that, that USAID and others are working closely uh, on that issue. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Let me go back to Jennifer. Go just a quick follow up on the lavender system. Is there any indication that the lavender system or any AI generated targets was responsible for this World Central Kitchen attack? Uh, again, I, I can't get ahead of an Israeli investigation. I know they're they're looking into this, so I'd have to refer you to them. And why wasn't uh, Secretary Austin on the call with the Prime Minister, given the military component of this current operation and discussion? Yeah, look, I, I don't think that that's, uh, uh, again, unusual. I mean, we do a series of phone calls. S senior leaders do a series of phone calls all the time, uh, depending on the topic to be discussed. Um, based on schedules, so that in and of itself is, is not unusual, actually. Just a follow-up questions. Um, since it's an evolving situation right now um, and things are rapidly changing, is the U.S. prepared to do its own investigation into the strike on the aid workers? That's my knowledge. And then also, do you have a total you could provide us of military aid provided to Israel since October 7th? Uh, I, don't, I don't have anything in front of me here today, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Valerie Shelburne with USA News. Has there been any impact to U.S. operations with the uh, Danish frigate that had the faulty missile launcher that's blocking entrance to uh, the Baltic shipping lanes? Um, I don't have anything on that. Thanks. Let me get a couple other folks I haven't called on here. Mike. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Uh, in August 21, 2021, the U.S. launched a drone strike that killed seven children and three adults. For several days, people in this building, including your predecessor and the former chairman, insisted it was a righteous mission. Um, nobody was punished for it. Nobody lost their job over it. I mean, is, is, it really, is the U.S. really in a position to be outraged about what happened in Israel since it seems to almost mirror what happened in the, what, what the U.S. did in Afghanistan? Yeah, Mike, I mean, I, I appreciate the question, but, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to talk about the past. Um, all I can talk about today is the present. And the fact is, you know, seven civilians who were delivering food to 
uh, people who are in extreme need were killed in an airstrike. So it's a tragic situation. I think we can all agree. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there. Sir. Thank you, General. Uh, Alan Fisher from Al Jazeera English. Can you remember yourself any time that the Secretary has expressed publicly his outrage at the death of aid workers in Gaza, including the more than 160 that died before the attack on Moral Central Kitchen? And if you can, can you point me in the direction of times where he expressed publicly his outrage at the death of aid workers before that incident? Yeah, look, the Secretary uh, clearly feels this is an important issue. Uh, he's addressed uh, the situation, uh, the civilian uh, and humanitarian situation in Gaza on multiple occasions. Uh, nearly every single time he speaks to Minister Gallant, uh, this is a topic of discussion and it will continue to be an important uh, topic. Let me go to the phone here. Constantine? Can you remember any time he expressed his public outrage? Because it seems to me this is the first time he's done that when an American has died and there's a lot of publicity globally about what's happened to World Central Kitchen. Look, again, the Secretary feels this is an important issue. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, communicate uh, your sentiment in that way, but I can assure you that this is an important topic for the Secretary. Let me go to ConstantineMilitary.com. Thanks, Pat. Um, on the on the JLOT's plans, um, I know you said that plans are still ongoing, that you guys are committed to putting the system in place, but has the World Food Kitchen strike altered those plans or caused you guys to think about any aspect of these plans differently and sort of related to that, I suppose, can you speak as to whether those plans involve any U.S. Navy warships being present in the area? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Constantine. Um, you know, so the, the short answer is uh, we continue to plan apace uh, and uh, continue to, as I mentioned, work towards implementation of JLOTs on schedule. Certainly, like any military operation, you're going to take factors uh, in the operating environment into consideration uh, to include the things that I mentioned earlier as far as uh, the security situation and ensuring uh, that security is taken into consideration as it relates to aid distribution. And so that will be taken into account. Uh, as far as uh, any additional assets like Navy ships, I don't have anything to announce right now. Uh, but again, uh, you know, we're always going to uh, put the safety and security of our forces uh, as a top priority in any of these operations. Thanks. Laura. Um, just as a follow-up, you said that the, Israel, the Israelis have committed to providing security for the pier. Why would you trust the IDF to protect the U.S. personnel setting up the pier when they struck the food assistance convoy after they had already cleared their route with the IDF? Look, again, I know Israel's investigating uh, in terms of the uh, the strike on World Central Kitchen, um, and um, we trust that Israel will provide the security that we need on the shore. Let me go to Jared. Hey, sir. Uh, nearly a month ago, a group of UN experts reported, quote, over 14 recorded incidents of Israeli forces shooting, shelling, and targeting groups gathered to receive urgently needed supplies from trucks or airdrops between mid-January and the end of February 2024. The quote goes on. Uh, Israel had also opened fire, uh, has op also opened fire on humanitarian aid convoys on several occasions, despite the fact that the convoys share their coordinates, coordinates with Israel. Um, that statement was issued on March 5th. Does the department see the strike on the World Central Kitchen convoy as uh, part of a pattern, and have department officials told their Israeli counterparts to stop the IDF uh, from firing on aid convoys or civilians gathered to receive aid? So well, look, uh, Jared, I think I addressed that, you know, in the in the top there where Secretary Austin again highlighted to Minister Gallant uh, the need to take concrete steps to protect aid workers and Palestinian civilians after repeated coordination failures with foreign aid groups. And so um, I think our expectation is that, yes, they will obviously need to do much better when it comes to ensuring that that aid is not only delivered more frequently into Gaza, um, but done so in a way that's safe and secure for those who are receiving that aid. So the subject of Israeli forces open firing on uh, civilians gathered to receive aid, this has been a subject of discussion in the past, in the past weeks and months. Uh, I think that the topic of taking civilian safety into account when conducting operations has been a topic uh, almost since the beginning of this conflict. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you. I have one in Ukraine and one in the Pacific. Uh, what does the Pentagon think about the idea voiced by Jens Stoltenberg about moving the Ukraine Defense Content Group under NATO leadership, given the concerns about the lack of support from the United States? Um, so I don't have any announcements to make regarding a shift in the overall you know, uh, management of the UDCG. Uh, as you know, Secretary Austin continues to convene this international forum. We just held our most recent session uh, at Ramstein last month. Um, of course, you know, there's always conversations that are going on to look at, at uh, how we can work with allies and partners to ensure that support for Ukraine is done in a systemic, sustainable, deliberate way. That's why you see things like the capability coalitions that have been stood up, the national armaments directors meetings. Uh, so going forward, uh, we'll continue to work with allies and partners on that front. But, but when it comes to uh, you know, NATO playing a bigger role. I just, I don't have anything on that. And another one from our colleagues. John Kirby told Voice of America today that the Pentagon would have more on joint U.S., Japan, and Philippine naval operations today. Uh, could, can you give us some details about those operations? So I don't, I don't have anything to announce today. Uh, we will in the very near future. Uh, so just stay tuned. Thank you. Nancy. Um, you mentioned that the Secretary wasn't a part of today's phone call with the Prime Minister. Has he been a part of any of the phone calls between the president and the prime minister? You're talking about like over the history of time? I, uh, let's say since October. I, I don't have an answer to that. Is that something we can answer on? You know, look, the, you know, again, as I highlighted, um, there is going to be um, phone calls that the president does if he wants cabinet ministers to join. You know, certainly that that's his prerogative. But I'd refer you to the White House to talk about who's joining uh, White House calls. It's really not my purview to be able to respond for the White House. Not your purview to say what the secretary is on a call? I guess I don't understand why it's secret or unreleasable if the secretary participates in such an important call. There haven't been that many since October. Any other questions? No, I just think I'd pr appreciate you taking the question. I don't, okay, I don't I'll think take it's the something question. that should go Thank to the White you. House. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Just one quick question. So Ukraine has struck a number of Russian oil refineries, and it seems like they're ramping up those attacks. Um, has the Pentagon communicated with Ukraine about this, and do you support these attacks at all? Um, Ukraine attacks against Russian oil refineries. Uh, you know, look, the, the assistance that we're providing to Ukraine is intended for them to defend their sovereign territory uh, and, and to take back their sovereign territory. We don't provide any assistance. Uh, for use outside of that. I'd refer you to Ukraine to talk about their operations. Um, certainly our focus is on making sure that they can defend themselves. Have you communicated with them about these specific We have matters? frequent conversations with our Ukrainian co counterparts on a variety of topics. So, Did you have one more? Yes, thank okay. you. I yeah. didn't wait since you uh, called me. Would you say, General, that the administration now is, is willing to use leverage against Israel to enact some changes in Gaza? Um, you know, Fadi, again, I'd, I'd point you back uh, to the readout, the president's uh, phone call on the readout, and just leave it at that. Again, I, I can't get into hypotheticals. I can't, you know, preview uh, any potential future actions uh, other than to say I'd, I'd refer you back to the president's you statement. I mean, it, this, it signals a certain shift, whether this is my reading or others. What would you say led to this point uh, to make hints at conditional support? Again, I, I appreciate the question. Um, that w that's a presidential decision, so it's really more appropriate for the White House to address that question. I can take one more. Yes, ma'am. Thank, um, thank you, General. Um, at the Japan-US summit scheduled for next week, I think the uh, security issues such as a modernization of US-Japan RC2 are uh, expected to be a main topic. Um, I know you're not going to get ahead of the outcome, but uh, as DOD, uh, what results do you expect from the summit? And um, a trilateral summit with, between US, Japan, and the Philippines uh, also is scheduled. And uh, considering the current situation of uh, South China Sea, um, what kind of cooperation um, do you expect from those three countries? Sure. Um, so as you highlight, I don't want to get ahead of the summit other than to say, you know, we certainly uh, look forward to the opportunity to talk with our Japanese allies uh, and further bolster our cooperation and our relationship uh, as one of our most pivotal allies uh, in the region. 
when it comes to um, the, the United States uh, and the Philippines um, and you know, tri working trilaterally uh, in the South China Sea, again, as I highlighted earlier, our main focus is on working together to ensure that the Indo-Pacific region remains free, it remains open, and that there's security and stability throughout the region. That is what our focus is. Uh, and so we'll continue to coordinate with one another uh, and look at areas where we can cooperate to ensure uh, that that's the case. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.